Take your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter number 12. Daniel chapter number 12. If you have your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible, should be a Bible in the pew there, King James Bible in the pew. Daniel chapter number 12. And we're going to read one verse together in unison, verse number 4. Daniel chapter number 12. I'm going to read verse number 4. Read from the King James Bible. Aren't you glad you're saved? Amen. Same eight people again. How can, how can you tell? Huh. Daniel 12, verse number 4. You ready? Let's read together. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. This is going to be a rare sermon on a Sunday morning this morning. I don't know if I've ever done this on a Sunday morning. I know I've taught this and preached this on Sunday night or Wednesday night in the years past. I can't remember if I've done this um, specifically on a Sunday morning, so it is kind of different for a Sunday morning sermon. I'm going to talk to you this morning about technology and inventions. Technology and inventions. All right? Dear God, thank you again for loving us. Please bless these dear folks for their faithfulness. Dear God, thank you, Lord, for salvation that we have through Lord Jesus Christ. And dear Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross and shedding your precious, sinless, spotless blood to wash away our sins. And thank you, dear God, for the day that we get to see you face to face for all eternity will be with you. Until then, Lord, help us to be found faithful, loving you, serving you, and helping others. Bless now, dear God. Meet with us, dear Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Now, as I go through this uh, sermon this morning, I'm going to ask you not to try to jump ahead and think all the possible things I could possibly say about technology or inventions. And just stick with me as we go through these Bible verses. But we come to Daniel chapter number 12 and verse number 4. This is a prophecy, and there's, there's so many in the Bible, there's no way I can go through them all this morning in a Sunday morning sermon. But I picked out just a few to let you know that God has prophesied that these things are going, were going to happen. It's not a shock for those of us who read the Bible or those before us who have read the Bible. They knew that these things were coming to pass. As much as they used to get mocked, for believing that and teaching that and preaching that. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, Daniel sees his vision and he said, the, the, the angel said, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So he's saying there's going to be a time in the future. Can you imagine? Two, let's go back 200 years. Man's been on earth about uh, almost 6,000 years, I'm guessing. Around, around 6,000. So you think for the first 5,800 years of man's existence on life, or on planet earth, think about how long it would take you to go from New York to California, horse and buggy, stagecoach, or on a horse. And think about how quickly you can get there flying in an airplane in a matter of three, four, maybe five hours to California. Think about how many months it used to take you going to Europe on a boat. My, my mom came as a teenager and landed at Ellis Island. I think they took her four or five weeks or six weeks just in the boat to get here from Europe. You can get to Europe now in a matter of four or five hours to England. In Germany, you get there six, seven hours. In Greece, you get there eight or nine or ten hours. And so this prophecy is fulfilled right in front of our, our very eyes. We don't even realize it. Many, look what it says, shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. We're living in a day and age that you, just from your fingertips, from your, your, your phone, your laptop, a computer, you can find out anything about anything today like never before. And so we have reached that time about technology and inventions, just like God had prophesied in the Word of God that it was coming. And there's no way you can stop it. Let me just say that because it's fulfilling prophecy the way God said it was going to be. 
I mean, you can get in your car today and drive anywhere you want and be, you know, you go 50 miles an hour. If you're with me, we go about 80 miles an hour, amen? But you can get there in 50, in 50 miles, you can go and be someplace in one hour. You know how late, long it'll take you just to walk 50 miles? I'm just talking 200 years ago. Or by horseback? 200 years ago, that's not a very long time in the span of man's existence on earth. So we have reached the time, the last 100, 150 years, we've had so many inventions come along and technology has, has progressed so rapidly, you blinked your eyes and something, something new came out. And so we're living in that day and age that God has prophesied. If you go down to chapter number 4, let's go, since we're in Daniel, we're going to read some verses here. Daniel chapter number 4. Actually, let's go to Daniel chapter number 2. Daniel 2 first, and then we'll, we'll move forward. Daniel chapter number 2. And in verse number 43, Daniel 2 and verse number 43. And here's Daniel explaining the, the, the vision. And he says, this is the king's dream, and Daniel's explaining it. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall what? Mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. How, what do you mean mixing the seed with seed of men? Look at Daniel chapter number 4. Daniel chapter number 4. This is what Baptist preachers have been preaching for thousands of years, and people used to laugh and mock, but today it's being fulfilled in their very eyes. They're mixing DNA and genes from animals and people. And they're playing God with test tubes today like never before. You know, you used to watch those Frankenstein movies and say, you know, that's just science fiction. Uh, not anymore. No. You used to watch, you know, when I was growing up, we were reading the Dick Tracy comics, you know, and, you know, Dick Tracy on his phone could talk and see somebody. You know, and that's just science fiction. Well, not anymore. You know. Uh, Daniel chapter number 4 and verse number 16. Watch this. Daniel 4, verse number 16. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him. That's what God said. You know why people are acting like a bunch of animals? Because they're being taught they're animals. The Bible clearly teaches against evolution. But you know what it is? It's devolution. Instead of progressing from a tadpole or an amoeba and, you know, popping out limbs... Talk about stupidity. It's the opposite way. Man is devolving down in animal state light, in beast state light. That's why they're acting like a bunch of animals. Because they're being taught in schools that they're nothing but animals. They came from animals. They came from monkeys. They came from amoebas. They came from tadpoles. And so when you believe that you came from a monkey or an animal, you're going to act just like that. But if you're taught that you were created by God Almighty... And that you're going to be responsible before God Almighty. You're going to stand before God Almighty. You know what? Then you're going to start thinking that way also. So he was, the Bible is very clear. Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him. Uh, look at Daniel chapter number 5. That's talking about Nebuchadnezzar. And now Daniel talks to his son, Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son. And he says, Daniel chapter number 5, verse number 21. And he reiterates this. And he was driven, talking about his dad, Nebuchadnezzar, he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast. And his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. Look at verse 22. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. You would think people would see how people are acting a bunch of animals like animals and say, well, I don't want to be like that. No, they keep going second generation, third generation, fourth generation. They're acting just like them, man. Just like their parents, just like their grandparents, just like their great-grandparents. You would think somebody would wake up and say, I don't want to die like that. I don't want to be a dopehead. I don't want to be a drug addict. I don't want to be a drunk. I don't want to be a gambler. I don't want to be a whore. I don't want to be a sodomite. I don't want to be like that. You would think they would wake up when you see the devastation that's happening to people. But no, when you hate God, you just keep on going in your sin, man. When you hate the Word of God, you just keep going because sin is pleasurable, the Bible says. Only for a season. Then it's going to catch up with you.
take your Bible, turn to Daniel chapter number 11. Daniel chapter number 11. These are prophetic statements that we're seeing fulfilled in our very eyes today. Who would have thought, who would have thought that you could take the seed or a gene of a man and a seed and a gene of an animal and combine them? Not until recently. Not until recently. Daniel chapter number 11, verse number 37. Daniel 11, verse number 37. This is talking about the Antichrist coming. The forerunner of the beast, the Antichrist. All right? And here's what it says about the Antichrist who's going to rule the entire world through a one world religion and one world government. The reason you ought to hate the UN is because it's depicted in the Word of God as the, as the one world government that's going to hate God. We ought to hate the UN. There's nothing good about the UN. It hates God, it hates the Word of God, it hates the preachers of the Word of God. Because it's prophesied what we're about to read. Daniel chapter number 11, verse number 37. Talking about the beast, the Antichrist who's coming. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Did you read that? It's a good indication the Antichrist is going to be a sodomite, a queer, a homo. Okay? Nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of what? For, you know, let the force be with you. Never saw Star Wars, but I hear that's a statement in there, you know. Let the force be with you, you know. And a God, small g by the way, whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strange holds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Look at verse number, uh, chapter number, uh, oh, I didn't write it down. Let's go to uh, Daniel chapter number 11 since we're there. So, or verse number 20. Verse number 20. The same person, the same person. The beast, the antichrist, the forerunner to the one world kingdom that's coming. So why is this? We've never, had, we've never lived in a situation where the entire world is deathly afraid of one thing. Now you think about that. In the entire history of mankind, everybody's been stupefied. And they're forcing, twisting people's arms spiritually, religiously, and personally to either wear a mask, get vaccinated, or they believe in this, this pandemic. Never in the history has this ever happened. We are on the precipice, we're on the doorstep of what's coming next. And I don't think we realize how close we are. Uh, Daniel chapter number 11 and verse number uh, 20. Watch this. Then shall stand up in his estate a what? A razor of what? The Antichrist is going to be a razor of taxes. One of the reasons that God's people ought to hate taxes is because it controls people. It's not for the good of anything. The only reason people put taxes on is so they get money from hardworking people to give to fat bureaucrats and their friends who are going to be employed by them so they can vote for them the next election cycle. God's people ought to be against taxes because the Antichrist is going to be a raiser of taxes. In Luke chapter 2, verse number 1 through 3, the Bible says, When Jesus was born, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. In Luke chapter 2, that all the world should be taxed. The first time Jesus came, the whole world was taxed. The known civilized world, when talking about the Roman Empire. When Jesus comes back the second time, the whole world is going to be taxed again through the UN, and it's going to be a worldwide tax, on, and it's going to be a one world religion and a one world government, and God's people ought to be against it, not for it. We're not here trying to build a kingdom. We're trying to get people saved. Anytime you hear a church, I don't care if Pentecostal, Evangelical, I don't care what kind of denomination it is, when you hear these words, kingdom building, the antennas ought to go up. The red alert ought to go, eh, 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 eh. no good. We're not kingdom building. Satan is kingdom building for the Antichrist that's coming. God's people ought to be against every single tax. I don't care what the tax is for. It doesn't matter to me. All right. If you can find this, turn to Nahum, chapter number two. Nahum. It's in the Bible. You'll meet Nahum one day in, the Bible, uh, in heaven, if you're saved, if you're a child of God. Nahum, chapter number two. I'm looking to. Nahum, chapter 
Nahum chapter number 2. I want you to read this. I want you to read it. If you can't find it, just pay attention. Nahum chapter number 2 and verse number 4. Here's a prophecy. The chariots. You know the old time chariots, the Roman chariots, the Greek chariots, the Egyptian chariots. You know, they're drawn by what? Four or six horses. You know. Well, here's a prophecy of modern day chariots. The chariots shall rage in the streets. That's road rage, right? 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 <laughs> they shall jostle one against another. You ever play bumper cars? Right? Or out in the streets and highways. They shall jostle one against another in the broad ways. In Broadway. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. So God says, this is written thousands of years ago. And it's only last, I don't know, 150 years that we have cars. Only 100 years or so, 120 years, that they were produced for the average individual. So for 5,800 years, and when this was written 3,000 years ago, you got to think, God was prophesying, telling us, there's going to come a time where there's going to be chariots in the streets, in the broad ways, like torches. In Jeremiah 30, verse number 6, I preached this 20, 25 years ago. People say, yeah, pastor, come on. You're just pulling it out of thin air, you know. If you want to turn there or read, or listen to this, Jeremiah 30, verse number 6, the Bible says, Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. So, and there's other verses too, not just Jeremiah 30, verse number 6. But God tells you in advance that there's going to be a time where men are going to give birth. How's that possible? That's not biological possible, Pastor. Well, yeah, if some queer or homo wants to be uh, inserted, uh, you know, I don't know what they call it, you know, in vitro, whatever they do, and, and implant a womb in there and let them grow, they can cut it by cesarean and deliver like these queers are doing. Now, for 58, 5,900 years ago, that was impossible. You never thought that. How, there's something wrong with that verse. It can't possibly be, Pastor. That's, that's biologically impossible, Pastor. Well, welcome to 2022, ladies and gentlemen. And this is just a scratching the surface of the prophecies that have been fulfilled in our very own time, before our very own eyes, and people are still oblivious to it, man. Take your Bible, turn to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Lucky number 13. Revelation 13. Again, a little different, but I'll get to the sermon in a little bit. Re Revelation 13. I just want to go through the Bible verses, so I'm setting the, uh, the sermon for this. Revelation 13. Starting in verse number 16. This is the Antichrist now, the beast. The beast. You know, it wasn't until recently the most grotesque things are what your children play with now. Ninjas. Gargoyles. The most grotesque um, alien creatures in science fiction movies are now the friendliest people, the friendliest beings, we can't wait till they come. Setting people up for exactly what's coming. And they're going to be devils that are going to come. I'm just telling you. Revelation 13, the beast. By the way, the first computer ever made was called the beast. It's called the beast. Or not the first one, but the biggest one in Brussels about 20, 30 years ago, the name was the beast. At that time, it was the biggest computer in the world. It was called the beast. Revelation 13, starting in verse number 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. And that's where you get 666. Do you realize the number six or the number nine uh, upside down are the easiest numbers for a computer to scan? 
You hear what I just said? The number six, for whatever reason, either six or the, or the inverted six, which is a nine, not inverted, but upside down nine, upside down six, are the easiest numerals for a computer to scan. How do, how do we know that? How, how could somebody write this 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and all the other verses we're not even going to get to this morning, and all of them being fulfilled before our very eyes? You, Nostradamus couldn't do that. He may have gotten one out of 100 correct. And you're saying, oh man, Nostradamus, what a great prophet he was. What well, about all the other ones he failed in? Anybody can make uh, good predictions like uh, Leonardo da Vinci, I think it was, who, who made some drawings and stuff like that, or Galileo. Well, not all of them turned out right. All these are turning out exactly like they were written. Every single one of them are being fulfilled before our very eyes. The Bible said in Revelation that 200 million were going to cross the Euphrates River to attack Israel. People used to mock at that, laugh at that. There weren't 200 million people on planet Earth at the time. How in the world can you get 200 million people crossing the Euphrates River? Well, you know what? Communist China's got about 1.3 billion people now. It's not out of the stretch of the imagination now. They're going to come from the east, ladies and gentlemen, and they're going to march. These things are being fulfilled in our very eyes, before our very eyes. In Psalm 99, verse 8, Thou tookest vengeance of their inventions. Psalm 106, 29. They provoked him to anger with their inventions. Psalm 106, 39. Thus were they defiled with their own works and went a-whoring with their own inventions. So, uh, Proverbs 8, verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright. But they have sought out many inventions. Take your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. So what do you do with all these inventions and the technological, technological improvements or advancements that we have today? Well, you need, God, you need a lot of wisdom to know what to do, to be honest with you. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. Chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. Verse number 31. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 31. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. I'm not here to tell you to get rid of your car or your cell phone or electricity. But what I am telling you, you better be prepared for the day that you can't use them. Because too many people are addicted to technology and inventions and they can't live without them. Do you know how many kids have killed their parents because a kid, the parents told them you can't watch a video game? Or they took away some kind of uh, cell phone from them? Do you know how many people have gone berserk because they're so addicted to these, to these uh, technologies and inventions? You can't live without your car. You can't live without some, some technology that nobody had up until like 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago. It tells you how addicted people are today, how spoiled, rotten people are today. So it says, they that use this world, I'm not against using a car. Thank God for chainsaws, amen? You can do a lot with one chainsaw, man. You can do a lot with a bulldozer, amen? I'm not against these. There's no way you can put everything back in the box. It ain't going back. You can try as much as you want. You can wish, I wish we didn't have all these, and I wish too, but God prophesied it would be here. It's here. You're here. You got to learn to live with it. But you've got to use it correctly and wisely and not be entrapped by it because it'll destroy you. You'll become soft. It wasn't technology and inventions that founded America. It was colonists and hardworking American patriots who cut out and carved out a, land, a living out in the wilderness, out in the woods, out in the mountains. No McDonald's, no Burger King, no Hyatt Regency, no Marriott. No cruise liners up and down the coast. That's what built America. A fear of God, a love of God, and the Word of God. And technology and inventions have ruined us and spoiled us. The reason you can't get a preacher to preach loud is because you've got a microphone. You think Jesus spoke softly when he spoke to 5,000 people along the shore of Galilee? 
You think, you think he whispered like most people do on, on videos, on the radio, on television? Dearly beloved. <laughs> Dearly beloved, we're gathered here today. You can only do that with a microphone. John the Baptist didn't have a microphone. So you, here's what happens. People hate loud preaching because of the technologies that you're so accustomed to. When's the last time you heard a street preacher somewhere? They all through the Bible. Jonah was a street preacher. Uh, all through it. The Bible says, they hate him that rebuketh in the gate. But you want somebody who's refined. Not like a John the Baptist, who got his head cut off. Not like Paul the Apostle, who preached on Mars Hill and was beheaded by Nero. Not like Jesus, who preached out in the, out in the streets, out in the open air, and was crucified. You want somebody who's, you know, polite, as we ought to be. Who's polished. Who's, who's uh, sort of nice enough and not just rough edges. You know, why do you have to be so loud? Why do you have to be so uh, extreme all the time, Pastor? Well, when's the last time you read your Bible? The Bible's a very extreme book. Huh? You wait till you meet God. You're going to find out I was backslidden. You're going to find out I was, I was uh, lukewarm. You're going to find out I was soft. You're going to find out I was liberal. When you meet God at the judgment, you're going to say, man, Pastor Cletus was soft, man. Now, you're sitting here thinking, man, he's just too extreme. He's just too hard. He's just too old-fashioned. He's just too narrow-minded. That's what you think now. But this is how Baptist preachers used to preach for 1,900 years. This is how Baptist preachers have always preached. This is why we were burned at the stake by the Pope during the Dark Ages. Because he hated this kind of preaching. Now we like soft preaching, smooth preaching. You can't even call it preaching now. Take your Bible, turn to Luke chapter number 16. The Gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 16. Let's see what Jesus, this is a red letter edition now. Let's see what Jesus said, huh? Luke chapter number 16. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, starting in verse number 8. I'm not saying you ought to get rid of your television, although you should. I'm not saying you ought to get rid of your cell phone, even though you should. I'm not saying that you should get rid of uh, uh, technology, even though you should. We're all, most people uh, use it for work today. You buy things and order things from home. It's so much easier. It made it, it's made it everything so convenient as a trap. That spider is building its web. And you're, you're not going to be able to do anything without a computer. You're not going to be able to buy anything without a, a mark. You're not going to be able to do anything without a scan on your cell phone. You can't order from home unless you take that mark. And it's convenient. If they deliver it to your house, you don't have to go out of your house. Luke chapter number 16. Verse number 8. And the Lord commended the... Un you got to read the rest of the, the, the first part of the chapter here. But the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. Watch this now. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Hey, if the people on Wall Street can make money, why can't you make money? Nothing wrong with making money. Nothing wrong with earning a living. It's sad for a lost person to be able to invest their money wisely, earn their money wisely, save their money wisely, and God's people are foolishly spending it and wasting it and not have nothing to show for it afterwards. And you know what Jesus said? He said, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. I ask you a question. Why can't you become a millionaire? Start your own business. Because you've been taught by a school to go, you're taught to graduate and get a piece of paper after four years of college so you can get out, get out of college and be in debt for like twenty to fifty thousand dollars and then go work at Burger King or McDonald's. Why don't you start your own business see what it's like? Because the government doesn't want you starting your own business because you know what? God may bless you you may make a million dollars and, and become wealthy so that you can be a help and a blessing to somebody else. They don't want you to be a capitalist. They don't want you to believe in free enterprise. They want you to be taxed and taxed and taxed so you can support the big government that gets bigger and bigger every day. Don't, don't you look at your paycheck at the end of the week? Don't you see how much taxes they take out? Doesn't it bother you? Or you think that's normal? Next verse, verse number nine. 
G this is a red letter edition, ladies and gentlemen. Pay attention now. And I say unto you, Jesus speaking, make to yourselves friends of mammon of, right, of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Uh, next question, what, what is your credit score? When's the last time you personally went to a bank and asked the banker who doesn't know anything about you, but can pull up your credit report and credit history and see whether you're honest in paying your bills or not? That's the kind of character you really have. Not the people that you think are your friends and people who like you and you hang around and your, and your relatives. No. Your character financially is what the banker tells you your credit report is like. You know what Jesus said? The children of this generation of the world are wiser than God's people are. Because you think, well, I'm just saved, and that's all you need to worry about. No, there's more to life than just being saved. It's, it's about growing up and maturing and helping somebody else. It's not about being, a, being selfish and living a self-centered life, ladies and gentlemen. Ecclesiastes 7, verse number 29. This only have I found, that God hath made, made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. People lived without electricity for the first 5,800 years of mankind's existence on earth. Think about that. It has only been the last 200 years that we've had electricity. And the vast majority of people live without electricity up to about 50 or 60 years ago. I said in the adult Bible study, if you were here, I went, our family went to visit Greece in 1968. That was the first time I went to Greece. I was 11 years old. I went to the village where my mom was born. I used to admit to up in the mountains, man. As I told people this morning, there was only one telephone in the entire village. It was in the, it was in the grocery store, the, uh, the uh, general store at the, at the bottom, halfway down the, the hill of, of the mountain. If somebody from America called the village, the person from the general store would come out and yell at the top of their lungs, towards the house, the home, of the person who the phone calls for and say, hey, you got a phone call from America, they're going to call back in 30 minutes, come back, come down here. And you would trudge down to the general store and wait for that phone call from America. No house in that village had running water indoors. No toilet indoors. No electric lights at all. At all. There was one light bulb in the entire village, it was in the general store. I don't think you realize how spoiled we, we are. I, I loved it. I was there for about a, a month or so. You had to go to the spring every day and fill up buckets of water and bring to the house, man. We had outhouses. If some houses, some of them had outhouses. I said, where's the toilet paper? I said, grab any leaves you want. Just don't get the poison ivy ones. Amen. I don't think you realize how spoiled we really are. Kings and rulers, dictators and despots and royalty for the past 5,800 years did not have the luxuries that we have today. And they did not live as good as we live today. The poorest person in America lives like royalty, better than royalty, for the last 5,800 years. And you don't even realize it. You're spoiled rotten. You're soft. And they're going to catch you like that. Because you're addicted to it. And they're going to tell you, you got to take the mark or it all goes away. Okay, I'll take the mark. I want to feed my belly. Hot running water right out of the spigot. Running water indoors. Hot showers and hot baths. There was a time, you know, everybody, the family took a, a Saturday night bath once a week to get ready for church the next morning. One tub with one hot tub of water. Daddy would go first, and then we use the same water for everybody else. God pity the last kid with all that dirty water had to take a bath in there. You could take a shower every single day and you're not even grateful when the hot water comes out. You're not even thankful. You don't, you don't even appreciate it. You expect the car to turn on as soon as you push that button or turn the key. Then you cuss and swear and scream as soon as it doesn't work. Try to get the horse ready. Get the horses out of the barn. Get the carriage out. Feed the horses. Clean out the stalls. Get the hay out, feed the horses so they can be ready when you need to go for a ride or go into town somewhere. I'm not upset. I'm just saying we have been spoiled rotten with these inventions and technologies that have consumed us. 
Their only heat was a fireplace. For thousands of years, all they had was a fireplace. Can you imagine cooking over a fireplace, ladies? It was their only heat source. No natural gas, no propane, no oil, no kerosene, no electric heaters. No buttons they could push on their thermostats. Air conditioning didn't come out until 1901. Just think about that, living in Florida. The first car was made in 1769 and was powered by steam. The 1886 Benz motor wagon was the first gas internal combustion car. Alexander Graham Bell was awarded the first U.S. patent for the invention of the telephone in 1876. The phonograph, it's unbelievable. The phonograph was invented in 1877 by Thomas Edison. The first permanent photograph of a, of a camera image was made in 1825 by Joseph Nisophore. The computer, you take for granted the, the fact that you can use a computer or your cell phone. The fact that you can call somebody. And then you get upset when the phone doesn't work. In 1956, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, there was a computer invented, which was a TXO. And I'm skipping like a whole page of the computer history, man. And considered the first transistorized computer. The first desktop and mass market computer, Olivetti manufactured the program 101 that was invented by Pier Giorgio Pirati at the New York's World Fair in 1964. I was there. I was seven years old and had no idea that the first uh, mass marketed computer was there. It was the first desktop computer introduced to the public. There were, about, there were sold about 44,000 at a price tag of 3,200 per computer in 1964. You know how expensive that was? Now you complain that you can get a laptop and it's gonna cost you for $400, $500. The first laptop or portable computer in April 18, 1981, the Osborne One was introduced by Adam Osborne, considered to be the first portable computer or laptop. In 1984, IBM Portable was introduced by IBM. In 86, 1986, the PC convertible computer was announced by the IBM PCD. That was its first laptop computer. The first notebook with an integrated CD-ROM, the IBM ThinkPad, introduced in 1994. Then the Apple computer, the first IBM personal computer, 1981. In 1992, Tandy Radio Shack introduced theirs. Toshiba, 1954, Hewlett Packard in 1966, Dell in 1985, Compact in 1983, Commodore in 1977, NEC in 1958. Television. Think about this. Can you imagine watching television? Can you imagine some of these folks coming back that lived 300 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and, looking, and just walking around and looking what we have? They, 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 they will not be able to comprehend what's going on. But we have it, and we're spoiled, and we're addicted to it. And it's going to catch you if you're not careful. When's the last time you went the whole day without a phone? When's the last time you went a whole week without a phone? I've told this before, but I guess it's got to be like eight years ago now, maybe nine or ten. Um, I fasted a whole year, just about, from my cell phone. I left my cell phone at the house, except for maybe two, three days that I made an important call. I, had to, I was either waiting for a call, I had to make a call for business, or what, I can't remember the personal reason for it. But for, except for those two, three days, I left my cell phone at the house every day. Now, if somebody doesn't answer you, you get upset. If somebody doesn't call you back, you get upset. When before, it used to take you weeks, if not months, to get a letter from uh, the United Postal Service on horseback. The internet came out January 1, 1983. The modern internet came out in 1991. Take your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 5, please. Ephesians 5. And we're almost done, can you believe it? Ephesians chapter number 5. 
Now the danger with the technology that we have is this. Before, when you got upset, and you were angry, and you were having an emotional uh, outburst, and you're all by yourself with no um, computers, technology, and no way to tell others what's going on, you cool down after a while. You let it go after a few hours or maybe a few days. But the problem with technology today is, as soon as something happens in your life, bang, it goes out immediately. There's no space for time for somebody to sit back and think and relax and meditate and get right and calm down. Right now, as soon as something happens, some tragedy, some heartache, some burden, some sickness, you want to tell everybody what's going on. You want to tell everybody what color your diarrhea is. You want to tell everybody what the temperature you just took your fever was. That's how immature people are today. You've got to tell everybody what's going on in your life. That is stupid, stupid, stupid. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. Did I tell you it was stupid? Verse 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So everybody now, because they're busybodies and tattlers, they have nothing else better to do. They go online and either gossip, smear people, slander people, talk about people, and tell everybody how, how bad their life is. Well, why don't you get right with God and use it to tell other people about God? The only reason I'm on the internet, the only reason I'm on a uh, fake book, I just got on about two years ago, is to bother people about God. Now, my wife's on there because we have relatives in Greece you can contact. It's easier, easier for that. And I understand people do that, and I think that's a great tool to use because you can contact people cheap. You don't have to call them. It used to call us, cost us hundreds of dollars to call Greece back and forth, man. Today, you can... FaceTime them. I can FaceTime my daughter in Burma and talk to my grandkids. And, and uh, once in a while, my son-in-law slips in there, but I talk to my daughter and my grandkids. Amen? In Burma, FaceTime, and it's free. And my wife uses it, and I use it, and I think it's a great tool to use. But when you're addicted to it, and you use it for vanity, they've got you. you they've got you. You're already hooked, man. You're already addicted to that. And when the mark comes as you can't buy or sell anything unless you take the mark, you can say, oh, well, I can't live without my cell phone. I can't live without my laptop. I can't live without a car. I can't live with, without the modern conveniences. They've got you, man. How do people do that for the first 5,800 years? How do they do that for the first 5,000 years? And you can't. You can. You choose not to. Amen. Inventions and technologies have ruined us. But you can use it, but don't abuse them. As Paul wrote, Ephesians 5 here, verse 12, it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. I don't want to go online and tell everybody what everybody's doing privately. It's none of my business. It's none of your business. I could care less what my neighbor's doing in their home by the, uh, next door to me. Just don't cross a line and tell me what I should do in my home. Amen? But people are so busybodies today and sticking their nose in everybody else's business, they want to tell everybody what everybody is doing wrong. They think in their own eyes. There was a time, I remember going to school, everybody brought, not everybody, but the kids used to bring pornography covered up and nobody would see it. And it was against the law. Now, you get on your cell phone, watch whatever you want. Now you can gamble whatever you want. All by yourself, nobody needs to know, man. Now you can watch the most filthiest, perverted things online and the minds are being perverted today online. Why don't you get online and tell people about the King James Bible and tell them about God? If you're going to be online, tell them about the King James Bible. Tell them about how to be born again. Tell them how to get saved. Tell them to go to old-fashioned Hellfire and Damnation Church, not to sit home and watch church on the internet. That's not church. I don't mind people working from home or buying from home or ordering from home. I don't mind how to YouTubes, how to video books or whatever. And they're great tools to use. I've used them, you've used them. But you know, when I was a court reporter starting out, until the internet came on, I had a stack of, of uh, telephone books in my office. For any of you folks have been to my old office, I had a stack of telephone books at least six to seven foot tall. 
of every single year, because I was taught in court reporting school, that when you have a, 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 a law firm or a company and they quote a business and uh, an address and you've got to do a transfer from five or ten years ago, the best thing to do is have a telephone book from that year and you can look it up. I wonder how many people know what a yellow pages are today. You don't even know what a telephone book is. Huh? Why? Because it's easy to search things, everything's online. I used to, when I, had a, when I was a court reporter and I had a question about a spelling, a name, a business, or some kind of technology, it was a medical expert or, or a business expert in some field, and I, I was ignorant of it. I had the phonetical sound, but I didn't know what the word was. You know what I did? I spent hours in the library. Hours on end looking at spellings and names. Takes me about three minutes now. It's convenient. It's, it's, it's time saver. I understand that. It's easy to want it and to use it. But when you get to the point that you're addicted to it and it's, it's, it's ruling you, you got a problem. You ought to rule the money. Money should not rule you. You ought to rule your, your computer and your, your cell phone. Don't let it rule you. You're going to be a slave or a master to it, whatever you decide to do. The first gas-powered tractor came out in 1892. The airplane in 1903. The light bulb. Can you imagine having light at night? The flashlight, the chainsaws, the cranes, and bulldozers, and paper clips, and staples, and rubber bands, and scissors, and the printing press. Hydraulic power and steel and stainless steel and guns and tanks and nuclear weapons and solar power and solar panels. Hey, do you remember if you're old enough the first video game that ever came out? Pong. Kid, if a kid ever looked at it, they say, "Man, that is boring, man." Now they got all kinds of war games and shoot 'em up, you know, whatever. I remember we got the first Pong game that ever came out, man. And we played it like, it was either like ten, table tennis or, you know, whatever it was. You go, you dial, did it, did it, did it, did it. And that was so cool, man. Why? Because there's new technology. You realize that color television only came out in the 60s? Now you got it on your phone, man. You don't even think, why is it taking so long to download? Now, here's the thing. There's so much knowledge that has increased, as Daniel said. You can find anything you want about the truth of the Word of God anytime you want it. There's no reason today, listen to me, I'm going to say this as clear as I can. There's no reason today why anybody does not know that the King James Bible is the Word of God. The only reason they don't is because they hate God, they're a liar, and they're lazy. They're too stinking lazy to find out what the, why the King James Bible is the Word of God. Do yourself a favor, go online. Don't believe me. Go online and search for one hour or two hours. That's all it'll take you to find out why the NIV is a perversion, the New American Standard is a perversion. Just took, put in the words and search it. You'll find out. It's not my fault that your minister, your pastor has been lying to you. That's not my fault that he's double tongue. It's not my fault. Search it and look for it. At least use the internet for something that's good and useful. The reason you ought to be an independent fundamental Baptist Search and find out. No one's going soul winning today except independent fundamental Baptists for the most part. No one's going street preaching today except for the independent fundamental Baptists for the most part. Yeah, no one's believing only the King James Bible today except the independent fundamental Baptists. Search online and find out for yourself. Why use the internet for vanity and videos and movies and pornography and gambling and not use it for God? I don't understand that. If you want to know doctrine and truth, you can find, if you're serious about it, you find out. Nobody today who has a cell phone or a laptop or can go online can ever say, honestly, I can't find the answer to that. I don't believe that at all. You refuse to know what the answer is. You're too stinking lazy to find out what's right. And here's the danger. I'm going to close with the danger of this. Here is the danger. The danger is that the churches have lost their edge because now they have to be politically correct. And churches and pastors now put sermons online to lure people into their church through soft messages and they drop the hard messages because of the controversies that would surround them if they ever let them online. 
So what independent fundamental Baptist church and pastors used to preach about hard truths and controversial subjects on either Sunday night or Wednesday night are off limits now. Because all the sermons, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, are being put online because we want to get more people. So Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, when the hard preaching ought to come out to warn people about being separate from the world, we've let that go. Because God forbid you were to preach on something controversial, you'll be doxxed, you'll be assaulted, you'll be harassed, you'll be violently attacked outside, because you know what? we're doing exactly what Baptists have done for 2,000 years. I'm not budging. I'm not surrendering. I don't care how much they dox us. I don't care what they threaten us with. I don't care how much they demonstrate outside. They can call us any kind of names. We're not changing. As long as I'm the pastor, I'm not changing, man. And I know, I know it's getting more difficult because society now, they just put everything online. They say, that's a racist church. You don't even know what racist is. You don't even know what the definition is. You're, that's hate speech. You don't even know what hate means. People hate God, hate the Bible. This is why they, they burn Baptist preachers at the stake. For what we're preaching. I don't think we realize how important the First Amendment is and the Second Amendment. I think we take it for granted. Our forefathers were burned at the stake, man, for preaching what we're preaching here. But you're listening to the wrong crowd. Say, you know what? That church doesn't love. That's, when I got saved, a few years after I got saved, uh, when I told you this morning, for those of you who are here, I left the... Baptist church I was baptized in because they weren't using the King James Bible. And I went to the Bible Presbyterian Church. When Dr. Carl McIntyre was, was uh, preaching and on the air. And uh, he married us, by the way. We went to the Bible Presbyterian Church. We got married. I got home from work. I was working as a court reporter. My mom says, John, do you know that the place you're going to, he hates people. I said, Mom, what are you talking about? He said, the priest was just here and he told me, where are you going? He hates people. Yeah, I know what people are telling you. That this kind of preaching hates people. No, this is the kind of God that loves people and warns them about sin. This is the kind of God that loved you and created you and made you to worship God Almighty, not Satan and, and the Satanists. Are you saved or are you going to hell when you die? Are you born again or are you going to split hell wide open? Are you a child of God? Have you surrendered yourself? Have you humbled yourself before a holy God and asked God to save your soul? Or are you one breath from hell right now? You need somebody to warn you that there's a real place called hell that you're about to go to if you're not born again. And anybody who doesn't tell you that is a coward, a spineless coward. Now, you ought to do it with love and kindness as much as you can, but this is preaching time this morning, amen? Somebody ought to tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ because once you die, it'll be too late. Buddha ain't going to save you. Muhammad ain't going to save you. They're all of the devil, man. Uh, the, all those other Eastern religions are not going to save you. You need the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, who died on the cross to pay for your sin to save your soul from hell. And if you're not saved, you're going to be burning hell forever. There's no escape and there's no getting out. Are you saved or are you born again? Are you saved? Are you born again? Are you lost? Which one is it? Don't let technology deceive you and fool you. You can't get away from it now. Use it, if you can, for the glory of God while you can. Use it to reach people with the gospel while you can. Use it to, to spread the truth of the word of God while you can. Because there's going to come a day that you're not going to be able to use it unless you take a mark. And that includes all technologies. I'm telling you, your car, your AC, your heat, all modern technology is going to be hooked up to a device that they're going to scan like you do at the supermarket. You say, it's so convenient to go sh to, uh, you know, check out, self-checkout. Self it's so convenient. I don't have to wait in line no more. It's so convenient. The day's coming. We're at the doorstep, man. We're, 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 about, we're about to see things in the next, if God tarries, in the next near future, man, that they only prophesied about and preached about and were mocked at for preaching it. Knowledge has increased. Just like Daniel 12, 4 said. Many shall run to and fro the day and age that you live in right now. We're living in it. Just don't be addicted by it. Use it, but don't abuse it, like Paul said. And try to get as many people saved and get the gospel out and get the truth of the word of God out as much as you possibly can while you can. And let's get people saved and let's live right. Let's all stand.
Dear God, thank you again for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for these dear folks. I know a little different kind of a sermon this morning. Uh, maybe not to the heart and not about a specific sin or some other topic. But something I believe that affects all of us. Every single person. Every single person didn't realize how much they use modern technology and inventions just to get to church this morning. The lights are on, the heat's on. Nobody loaded up the coal furnace today or the wood boiler today. Nobody uh, started the, the fireplace here this morning, but there's two fireplaces here. We just push buttons and expect the heat to come on. We get in the car, push the button, turn the key, and just expect it to get here. Dear God, there's so many things that we have... Um, become just used to that we take things for granted and one day all somebody has to do is turn a switch off and say you can't use any of this until you take a mark or unless you take a mark and then we're going to see people come from come out of the woodwork that are willing to take a mark of the beast dear god please help us to be prepared for that day help us to be prepared not to be addicted to the things that are about us but to use them even even though inventions and the technologies, even for your honor, for your glory, to get people saved. I thank you for a microphone. I thank you for loudspeakers. I thank you, Lord, for a building that we can meet in. I thank you, Lord, for all the advantages and the uh, luxuries that you've allowed us to have. But, Lord, help us not to be spoiled because of it. Help us not to be soft because of it. Help us to think about our forefathers, spiritually, who, who, who trudged through snow. I think about Valley Forge, General George Washington. Marching through that winter from Valley Forge to Trenton. And then attacking on Christmas Day. Lord, our nation is soft today. And we expect liberty. We demand liberty and freedom, but we're not willing to pay the price sometimes. Bless these dear folks for their faithfulness, dear God. Bless this invitation. I pray for folks to get saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Whatever your need is, you do business with God.